Welcome to our lecture online. Here we have another good example of a entrance exam question. This one particularly for the JE advanced exam. It deals with physics and mechanics and it also deals with angular momentum. So here we have a disk of mass m that's rotating at initial, initial angular velocity omega sub naught with the two masses starting at the center. Notice that the mass 1 and mass 2 have the same mass, they're equally mass and they're equal to 1 8 the mass of the ring. The two rods along which those two masses move are massless and frictionless, so they do not add to the angular, the moment of inertia of the rotating disk. They tell us that after the whole system slows down to 8 9 of its original omega, one of the masses is now located at a distance of 3 fifths r away from the center, and the question is, where is the second mass at that moment? Now, because of the symmetry and because of the two masses starting at the same point, you would imagine that they're subjected to the same forces and that the second mass would move to the very same position in the same amount of time as the first mass. So, I would right away think that 3 fifths r would be one of the answers, at least the answer. But let's work it out systematically to see if that's indeed the case. Again, this is a question regarding the conservation of angular momentum, which means that L1 must equal L2, and L is equal to the product of the moment of inertia times the angular velocity, so that means that we should be able to write the equation like that. So let's start with solving it that way and see if we get the same answer, 3 fifths R, or maybe get a different answer. So starting out with, with uh, L1 equals L2, First, the two masses are at the very center, so they do not add to the angular momentum of the system and the two masses at the center. So the initial position is the moment of inertia of the ring, which would be m r squared for the angular... Um, well, let's see here. I don't like to skip steps, so let me put this in between. So this would be i1 omega 1 equals i2 omega 2. So in this case, I would be the moment of inertia of the ring, which would be m r squared times the original omega. So that would be the original angular, the original moment of inertia, or the original angular momentum. <laughs> All right. So now, once they've moved out to some distance, so we know the first distance, we don't know the second distance. This would be d2. We don't know what that is. That's what we're looking for. But so this would be, there would be m r squared times 8 ninths omega sub naught. That would be the contributing portion of the, of the ring that's rotating. Plus would be m, and now the distance would be 3 fifths r, so it would be 3 fifths r squared, because all the mass is at the location, times 8 ninths omega sub naught. And then the second one would be plus m times d2 squared times 8 ninths omega sub naught. So this is the angular momentum at the end, this is the angular momentum in the beginning, and they should be equal to each other. Well, let's see here. We can simplify things by realizing that omega sub naught appears in every term, so that can go away. And we have an r squared, r squared, r squared, and d squared. So unfortunately, the r squared does not go away. So we can move everything with the r squared to one side and keep the d squared on the other side. We may want to multiply everything by 9 over 8 because that at least gets rid of these right here. So I'm going to multiply everything by 9 over 8. So let me use a different color. So multiply the left side by 9 over 8, multiply the right side by 9 over 8, which means that these all turn into 1s. Makes things a little bit cleaner. And um, now what we want to do is we want to move this over to this side. So now we have 9 over 8 minus 1 mr squared, because we're moving the mr squared to the left side, so that's minus 1 mr squared from the 9 8 mr squared. Move this to the left side, so it would be minus. Notice that m is m divided by 8, so I'm going to go m divided by 8 instead of little m times 9 over 25 r squared, and that should equal on the, on the right side, little m is m over 8, 
m over 8 times d2 squared. And that's what we're looking for. Now that I've written it like that, notice I can get rid of all the m's because every term has an m in it, so the m's cancel out, so this m and this m and this m cancels out. And then I can probably make things easier if I multiply both sides by 8. If I multiply both sides by 8, so again, I'm going to multiply the left side by 8 and the right side by 8, like that. Then what I have is I have 9 minus 8, 9 minus 8 times r squared minus, the 8 goes away, 9 over 25 r squared equals, the 8 goes away, and that would be d2 squared. All right, I'm getting closer here. So here we have 1 r squared minus 9 over 25 r squared, or 25 over 25 r squared minus 9 over 25 r squared equals d squared. So this becomes 16 over 25 r squared equals d squared. So finally, d is equal to the square root of that, which would be 4 fifths times r. Okay, so if I use the conservation of angular momentum, I notice that this is the correct answer. But from the logic that I use symmetry, if I just say, well, I'm going to bypass all this because all the forces acting on both of these small masses are the same. The whole thing is, is rotating. It will push the two objects away from the center with the very same force over the same, very same amount of time. So if one of them reached a distance of 3 fifths r, the other one should have reached a distance of 3 fifths r as well. So I would say that this is also a possible answer. Depends upon what logic you want to use. They can both be this correct at the same time. So I would say, based upon this, I would pick 4 fifths r. But that kind of violates the principles of physics because the same forces act on the two masses starting from the same point, which means they should reach the same distance. By that logic, this should be the answer. So when I looked up the answer on the official sheet that comes with this test, they said that it could either be C or D or both of them together, C and D. Wow, so I think what they might have realized at the end is they may have made a mistake and they had to kind of adjust the answers afterwards. Not sure what the concept here was, but you can see that either one, if you had chosen just D, you would have been correct. If you had chosen C, you would have been correct. If you had chosen C and D, you would have been correct as well. So they did not penalize you for picking those answers. Kind of interesting, but this is how it's done. You are absolutely correct. So you realized in the very beginning that, hey, if one moves out three fifths R, then the other one should have moved out three fifths R if they're both on massless and frictionless rods. And you're absolutely correct. That should have been the case. But then when you calculate it out and use the conservation of angular momentum, you get a different answer. And that really isn't correct. So I think they may have put it on the test and realized afterwards that they made a mistake happens. I've done that before too. Quality control. <laughs> no quality control in this one. You got it.